Acts chapter 14, that's where we are. Let's pray as we get into it. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit who makes the word to come alive. Thank you for your grace to hear and respond. Thank you for the courage to take the word and embrace it. Thank you for the life that is ours in Jesus Christ. Be with us, we pray. Strengthen our hearts. Fill us with your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. This chapter begins with the words, now at Iconium. You'll re remember, those of you that were here for our last study, that the previous chapter ended with Paul and Barnabas uh, reaching uh, a, a good number of Gentiles in the city of Antioch, Pisidia. And now they've moved on here as we open up chapter 14 to the city of Iconium. Let me put that on the screen for you. You can see where they were in Antioch up at the top of the screen. Notice there's two Antiochs there, but they were at the one on the left and they made their way that short distance where you see the circle to the city of Iconium. Again, in verse one, it says, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. And by Greeks, Luke is referring to Gentiles in the Jewish synagogue who had come to faith through Judaism, all right? And so these people are believing the good news message that Paul and Barnabas brought to them. But it says, verse 2, and there's always a but here somewhere, but the unbelieving Jews, take note of that, stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. In other words, what that means is they were slandering Paul and Barnabas by saying all kinds of nasty things, trying to tarnish their reputation and the things that they were saying. Have you ever been slandered by anybody? Have you ever had somebody say things about you that were untrue and, and uh, not just rude, but downright uh, hurtful and wrong and so on and so forth? How did you respond? Not asking you to speak out, obviously, but but, you know, think about how you responded. Now think about how they responded. Look at verse 3. So they remained for a long time. I just think that's amazing. It says, so here they are, you know, they're hanging out uh, there in Iconium, and they got slandered, and so they stuck around. What sounds odd to you about that? You know, it, 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 it just doesn't sound right. It says they remained for a long time. In fact, Speaking boldly, Luke writes, for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done uh, by their hands. So there's even, there's miracles going on. But the reason I point out the fact that they stuck around in the midst of all of this slander that was happening is because when we're being slandered, when we're being lied about, really that's the last thing that we think about doing is sticking around. We usually want to get away. Uh, in order to kind of, um, uh, I don't know, rescue our damaged reputation or something like that. And one of the reasons that we want to leave or get away from people at least who are slandering us is because it's all too easy for those who hear slander to believe it. It's just, it's just a, a common element of, of our humanity, when we hear something negative about someone, we're just, we're very likely to believe it. Whether we know the facts or not, whether we were around or not, when the supposed incidents took place or were said or whatever, doesn't really matter. We just hear something negative about someone and we're like, yeah, I can believe that. Yeah, I'm sure that's probably true, you know. But I love how Paul and Barnabas just stuck it out. And they, they, they just continued to be faithful. And that's the point. They continued to be faithful and tell about the good news of Jesus uh, on the cross. Um, you'll notice at the end of verse 3 again, the, it says, The Lord bore witness to the words of, word of his grace, granting signs and wonders uh, to be done. 
So the Lord allowed Paul and Barnabas not just to stay there, not to press through, not just to press through, but he also confirmed their faithfulness and their faithful message with signs and wonders. And, and there's such wisdom in just putting your head down and carrying on. You know, that's something the Lord taught me. You can imagine, you know, in 33 years of pastoring this church, there's been, there have been times when uh, things didn't go so well. And, and, uh, and, and then, they, you know, people start talking as they typically do. And there's things being said and so forth. And I, I remember going through a time like that. It was a number of years ago. And kind of asking the Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord made it very clear to me. And it was before I really had, had understood the, the full brunt of this passage and what Paul and Barnabas were doing. But the Lord said to me, he said, Paul, I want you, I want you to put your head down and I want you to plow. I've given you a plow. I want you to plow the land. Just put your head down and be faithful. And do not listen to what is being said, and whatever you do, do not respond. And he, he made it very clear that I was not to defend myself in any sort of words of slander. And um, thankfully, that's exactly what I did. And I am so, I'm so grateful to the leading of the Lord. Let me show you a couple of Proverbs that just kind of punctuate this. First, from Proverbs chapter 21, it says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. In a more common language, we'd say, whoever keeps his mouth shut keeps trouble far away, right? And then from Proverbs chapter 20, it says, it is to a man's honor, actually, to avoid strife. But you know what? He says, every fool is quick to quarrel. And I've tried to always remember that, that you know, you know what it takes for a quarrel to take place? Two fools. That's all. All you need is two fools in the room, and you got, you got a recipe for a good, solid quarrel. But if there is one fool and one wise person, you know what? That quarrel's never going to get off the ground. Because, you know, one thing about quarrels is people don't like quarreling with themselves. They don't like just sitting listening to themselves quarrel. They'll, they'll say something inflammatory, and if you decide, you know, that you're not going to respond, you're not going to respond with any sort of a quarrelsome response or, or retort, you know, the thing is just going to die out. So anyway, there you go. <laughs> There's some very good practical wisdom from the Word of God today. Let's keep reading here because you know, we're going to find out that even though Paul and Barnabas didn't respond to this slander, it did, there did come a point of time when they needed to leave. And it's in verse 4 following. It says, but the people of the city were divided. And again, some of the people listened to the slander. Some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers, so in other words, some of the people who were in charge, to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there, they continued to preach the gospel. So Luke tells us that it got to the point where they simply had to move on in order to kind of... And, you know, I really believe that, that part of this was not just for Paul and Barnabas to say, you know, let's, let's protect ourselves from this foolishness. But I think that there was also a sense where they needed to let things settle down for the new believers too. Because, you know, they got a town full of people who have just come to faith in Jesus. And for them to stick around and just allow this turmoil to continue, that's going to be counterproductive. These people need to grow in their faith. So it's like, you know what, let's just, let's move on to the next town. Let's let things settle out for these new believers so that they can grow in their faith. Let me put, a, again, a map up. You can see where uh, they went. I've circled the cities of, of uh, Lystra and Derby so that you can uh, see them. And by the way, um, when you think about Lystra, if you uh, remember that Lystra was the hometown of a young man by the name of Timothy, then you get an A, you can go to the front of the class. Although Paul's not going to really connect with him until the next time 
uh, he comes in the, his second missionary journey, uh, and that'll be in chapter 16. Uh, but that is where Timothy was raised and, and so forth. But anyway, during, during this visit now to these towns, it says in verse 8, look with me there. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and he had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, check this out, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, in other words, in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. So they're beginning to yell loudly, you know, that, that, that Paul and Barnabas are gods. Now, we assume that Paul and Barnabas didn't speak Lyconian, and so they're oblivious at this point. They, they know there's just people are kind of getting all lathered up and, and yelling and talking, but I, I don't think they have any idea what they're saying at this particular point. Um, and so... <laughs> Look what it goes on to say. Verse 12, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowd. So, you know, because of this miracle that the Lord did here. Oh, that was interesting. Uh, speaking of miracles. Um, because of this miracle... Um, they, they begin to assume that they're, they're, they're gods and, and they're going to sacrifice uh, to them. And it says, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men like, of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And obviously, Paul and Barnabas shared a common language with the people as they begin to exhort them. So they're probably speaking to them in Greek, I'm assuming, you know, since this, this is all Roman territory. And, and so they go on and they say, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, which is a way of saying, you know, God bore with paganism for a while. But it says in verse 17, this is interesting, yet he did not leave himself even then without a witness. And when Paul talks about a witness that the Lord left, he's talking about the witness of nature, right? The witness of creation. Do you know that creation is a witness of God's existence? He, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, if you want to take time and read it. And, and Paul outlines in Romans 1 that, that God has always been speaking. In fact, he says in that chapter that there's no language on earth where the voice of, the, of creation has not spoken clearly of the existence of God. And he said, you know, some men have, people have chosen to, to, to hear that voice and some have denied it or rejected that voice and said, well, there, 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 there's no such thing as creation because there's no such thing as a creator and so we don't believe in creation. And of course, now we, we, we hear a lot of talk about evolution, that things evolved. There is no designer to all of creation, even though things look designed. Do you know that's what evolutionists literally say? They say, oh, yeah, we know that things look designed, but you have to keep telling yourself there's no designer, there's no designer, there's no design. You have to keep saying that because I know that things look designed. What does that look like to you? That looks like just rebellion and denial to me, doesn't it? You know, well, anyway, that's kind of the way things go. So God says, you know, he's always had a witness and what is, you know, he even talks about the results of that witness here in the end of verse 17. For he did good, he says, by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You think all those things came just because of evolution? No, that, they were gifts from God, he says. And then Luke says, look at verse 18. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. So, 
you know, you can see that even after doing their best to try to convince these people that they were not gods, they went on to exhort them to turn from their foolish belief in pagan deities and to embrace the one true creator God uh, who provides for all of their needs. And by the way, this isn't the last time Paul is going to be mistaken for a god. You know, I would think that would be a fairly heady thing for somebody to think. I mean, you know, it's one thing for somebody to kind of go, you're really cool, you know, or even can I have your autograph or something like that. But for somebody to go, you're a god, <laughs> that kind of raises it just a little bit on the level of, you know, uh, appreciation and adoration. And I would think at times there might even be a temptation, however small it may be, to kind of just go with the flow on that one. Well, you know, maybe you're right, sort of a thing. You know? Hey, other, other men have done it. Anyway. But we're going to see how quickly the tables can turn from adulation to murder. Verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. These are the cities where Paul and Barnabas had been. They traveled from those places all the way here to Lystra, where they now are. And it says, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. Pause there, please, for just a moment with me. What that means, in other words, is they left him for dead. They stoned him and they left him for dead. And they probably had good reason to suppose that he was dead. Because stoning was a fairly effective way of executing an individual. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we, you know, read an earlier uh, chapter and we found out that uh, Stephen was, had rocks and stones thrown at him and they killed him quite effectively. So you see, this was, this was a, a, a common way of, of, of killing people. And so the fact that they left him for dead, believing, supposing that he was dead, it was, it was a good guess on their part. And they may have even been right. We don't really even know for sure. Because, you know, they, know how to, they knew how to do that kind of stuff, I dare say. Which makes the next verse that much more incredible. In verse 20, it says, But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. And I want you to stop and just really consider that verse for just a moment, if you would. Verse 20. Because I think it's one of the most incredible verses in the Bible. For the sheer fact that it just doesn't fit with our natural understanding of how cause and effect takes place. You know, as it relates. And I don't know if you've ever witnessed anyone being stoned. I certainly uh, I doubt it at least not the kind of stone that comes from rocks and stones. But, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't just get dragged out of a city, have rocks and stones thrown at you to the point where the mob thinks you're dead, and then you just get up and go back in the city. It just doesn't happen. That's, that's not the cause and effect that we're accustomed to. So right away, right away we're we're struck with the very strong suggestion in this passage that we're dealing with a supernatural intervention of the Lord uh, as it relates to the life of the Apostle Paul. And I believe it. I believe it. Because uh, all we're told is that the believers gathered around him. You know, typically what would happen if this was all on natural, on a natural level, not a supernatural, but a natural level, you would say the, the believers gathered around him, prayed, picked him up, took him to the nearest emergency room where he was on life support for the next week and a half or something like that, or using more modern language. You don't just hear, well, the believers gathered around him and he got up, brushed himself off and said, phew, what a drag, let's go back in the city. That's not the kind of cause and effect that we're accustomed to. So this is really a very amazing passage. And I got to be honest with you. I wouldn't experience stoning like that and then get up and go, I'm going to go back into that city. 
That's another thing I wouldn't do. But that's exactly what they said. But then they later went on, it says here, to Derby, and that was the other city that we showed you on the map, just west of Lystra. And we're told, look at verse 21 with me in your Bible. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, look at this, they returned to Lystra. That's where the stoning took, uh, happened. And then they went on to Iconium and Antioch, where the people who came to stir up the people in Lystra came from. So in other words, this is a fearlessness and a courageous attitude that comes from the Lord. This is a boldness that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to literally go back to the fire and to deal with it on a personal level uh, without fear. It is truly just amazing. And here's what they did. And I want you to pay attention to verses 22 and 23 because we're going to land on these for just a minute. It says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. All right, stop there, please, for just a moment, because there are four things that I want to bring out from these two verses that I think we need to stop, we need to pause, and we need to talk about uh, for just a moment. I'm going to put these on the screen, and the first one is that they were strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And the reason that I think this is an important thing to pause and talk about is because this is what churches should be always doing. Always doing. This is, this is what should happen when you go to church. Now, remember, we are the church. But I should say, when the church gathers. You know, so people will write to me from time to time and say, Pastor Paul, I don't, I don't know if I'm in the right church. I don't know if I'm going to the right fellowship. Can you help me figure out if I'm in the right fellowship? I'm like, well, when you get done and you get, go out and get in your car, let me ask you this. Are you encouraged, strengthened, and built up? Or do you feel like you've had the air let out of your tires? Well, this is, this is, a, good, this is a good way to figure it out. Do you walk away encouraged, strengthened, and built up? when you've gathered as the body of Christ. Because again, this is what every church should be doing. Every, every time, every time we, we get together, it's what we all need. But, you know, the, one of the other things I, I hear from people is what happens or, or the natural result of them not being in fellowship on a regular basis. So they haven't been getting encouraged, strengthened, and built up. And so often people will contact me in a, in a state of sheer panic because they've been deprived of what we're seeing right there on the screen. They've, they've deprived themselves because they've ignored the simple admonition of the Word of God do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, which is the habit of some. That's in the book of Hebrews. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It says it right there in the Bible, but you know what? Christians read it and they do it anyway. They forsake the, the assembling of themselves together. And what happens? They deprive themselves of the encouragement, strengthening, building up that, that should be happening in the body of Christ. And then... When something devastating or difficult or challenging or traumatic in their life happens, they fall apart because they're in a very weakened spiritual state. And I have to tell you, that's a very common thing for me to hear, you know, because people have not been in the word as they should. They have not been in regular fellowship. They have not been spending time in prayer and they haven't been built up. Guys, you got to consider going to church like going to the gym. You all know what that's all about. I don't know how many of you actually do it. And I'm not suggesting you should because that's, well, I won't talk, forget it. But, I mean, there is something good about going to the gym. There is, there is uh, something 
important about exercise, <laughs> even though it hurts <laughs> sometimes and sends pains down your leg all the way down to your ankle. But um, we need spiritual exercise. We need to be spiritually built up. We need to be spiritually encouraged. And that's what should be happening every time we gather. And, and otherwise, it's just a flat-out recipe for defeat. And there are a lot of defeated Christians walking around. Can I just tell you that? There's a lot of defeated Christians. And I'm sure you guys run into them from time to time. You may have even been one. And you're at work or at the store or whatever, and somebody just kind of cuts loose on you, and they start telling you about life and all the challenges, and, and you know that they're kind of falling apart at the seams. And instead of, instead of, and, and, and it's hard to know what to do, isn't it? You know, when somebody's, gonna, so, you know, just know in your heart, well, this person needs to be built up. They need to be strengthened. They need to be encouraged. So you can encourage them accordingly. But I think it's very important to also note the second thing that Paul and Barnabas did with the churches there. Check out on the screen. Number two is they said through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And the word tribulations means troubles, hardships, losses. That's the definition of tribulations. So what is Paul saying? We got to go through lots of those. Our life is marked by lots of those things. That's what they were saying. But my observation is that modern day Christians, particularly here in the United States of America, don't believe this. In fact, they reject it. And they believe that if they're going through tribulation, troubles, hardships, or losses, that it is something contrary to their Christianity. That's what I find that, that, that uh, Christians will often convey to me. In other words, they reject the idea of a reality in Christ that includes suffering. They reject that idea. And they do so despite what the Word of God has to say. Up on the screen, 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with this same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. John 16, 33, the words of your Savior, In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. See, that's, this is what the Word says. This is what the Word says about suffering. But to me, what Christians say to me is, what's happening to me? What is this? What's going on? What did I do? What did I do to deserve this? <laughs> yeah, you came to Christ. Thirdly, what they were telling them is in verse 23 that they appointed elders for them in every church. You can see that on the screen. And we've made the point in the past that the title elder is synonymous with overseer and pastor. Okay? So before Paul and Barnabas would leave the areas where they had raised up believers in a local fellowship, they would raise up leaders. They would raise up and ordain elders to... to lead the people, to guide them and to teach them and so forth. And later on in Paul's uh, ap apostolic ministry, he actually had guys like Timothy and Titus who he would leave behind. He'd go to an area, preach the gospel, raise up believers, and then he would go, all right, I'm leaving Timmy with you. I'm going on to the next town. He's going to stay. He's going to raise up leaders, elders, overseers, and then he's going to come and join me, and we're going to move on to the next place. And it was a very cool system that he kind of had going there. But it was very important. And, 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 and by the way, when we go through the letters of Timothy and Titus, that's where Paul gives the most information about what it is to raise up leaders within the church. Uh, so that was a very important part of the local church. And, and that's why um, home churching has its limitations. You know, a lot of people got into it during the pandemic. They decided that they were just going to do home churching. 
And I, I understand, you know, I mean, when you, can't, you couldn't go anywhere for a long time, or at least you were discouraged from going places. And, and now, you know, you kind of got used to it. You kind of got used to going to church at home. Well, guess what? There aren't leaders, though, to exhort you there. And, and so you lose something. Home, home church is not the ideal. It was, you know, I mean, the churches in, in the first century met in homes, but they weren't home churching. The, home, the church that met in their home had leaders that were there, elders, overseers, pastors, that sort of thing. All right. Finally, at the end of verse 23, it says, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And that's because, of course, you know, Paul and Barnabas could only stay as long as they could stay. And when they had to leave, they had to leave. And so what they would do is they would have a time of prayer and fasting and they would commit the believers to the Lord. And this was a kind of just a nice way of saying that they would entrust them to the Lord's care. And you know, anybody who's ever been a parent who has raised children to adulthood knows what it is to entrust your children to the Lord, right? Because parenting is, is fun. Well, it's not always. But parenting is, you know, when you have your kids in the home and you, can, and you can parent them because they're children, parenting is much more straightforward. But, you know, there always comes a point in time, and it has for Sue and myself four times now, all four of our kids are grown and adults and out of the home, where you're parenting uh, has to change. And I've said this many times. You, you parent differently when your kids leave home. You parent on your knees. You can't say the things to your adult kids that you used to say to them when they were children. You can't look at them and go, don't do that. You know? And you certainly can't spank them. So what do you do? You pray for them. You get down on your knees and you pray for them and you entrust them to the Lord. And you cry out to God, sometimes with all your worth, when they don't seem to be heading in the right direction. Right? And that's really, that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas were, were, were doing for the church fellowships, these young fledgling church fellowships that they were leaving behind. And Paul literally saw himself like a father figure. It was like dad leaving home and leaving the kids to kind of fend for themselves. But he knew they weren't fending for themselves. He knew the Lord was with them and, and so forth. And so he prayed for them. And we know how he prayed for them because in some of his letters, he included his prayers, which is beautiful. And, and this even, in some of the churches, he didn't even raise up on his own, like the church in Colossae. Do you know that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, but he didn't actually raise up that church. It was raised up by Epaphroditus. And, and, and look at, but he still prayed. Look at, on the screen. Paul says, so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You know why I share that? Not only does it show you how Paul prayed for these early new churches, but it's, it, it's, it's a great pattern for you who are praying for your grown kids. Use this. Use this as a pattern. Sometimes you don't know how to pray for them, you know. And so there's a, there's a pattern. And the chapter ends with these words. Then they passed through Pisidia. I'm in verse 24. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, which they had been previously uh, they went down to Atalia or Attilia, depending on how you see it. Uh, here's a map showing you uh, those last two places that they visited. And from there, they sailed back to Antioch. That's the Antioch on the right of the screen, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together together, 
they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they remained no little time with the disciples. And so as soon as they got back, they had a meeting and Paul and Barnabas shared uh, their experiences with the, the body of Christ there at the church in Antioch. And can I just tell you that uh, this Wednesday we're going to do the same thing? You probably heard Aaron say that, but this Wednesday we're going to have a few of the folks from our fellowship who went to Kenya and they're going to come and they're going to declare all that God did there. And they're going to tell you uh, what happened. And uh, so we just really want to invite you to join us uh, this Wednesday here in the main auditorium, 7 o'clock. Like Aaron said, we're not going to start with worship this time. So we're going to get started right away at 7. So get here a little bit early. And let me just warn you, by the way, two things I need to tell you. First of all, you can't stay home because we're not going to live stream it. Okay? Um, this, is, this is something we feel that is important just for, for our family here. Uh, but secondly, I want to warn you that when you get here on Wednesday, there's going to be construction going on in here. So there, you're going to see some scaffolding and probably some drop cloths and things like that around here because we're going to be doing a little uh, painting and, and stuff here in the auditorium. But just, you know, it'll be okay. We're, we'll, I think the Lord will be here anyway. Amen. Yeah, so anyway, let's stand together. We'll close in prayer. If you need prayer, come on up afterwards. We'll have some folks up here to pray with you. Father, thank you for your love, for your word, for the reminders, for the blessing of being the body of Christ. We thank you for nourishing us every time we come together. We thank you for filling us, for teaching us, for instructing us, and for encouraging us to walk with you faithfully. As we go from this place, Lord, help us to put all that we have heard, all that we have received into action in our lives. Teach us throughout the week to apply your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. All God's people said together, Amen. God bless. Have a good rest of your Sunday.